Okay, continuous monitoring stations in the Delaware River Basin for understanding individual sites and regional patterns. I'm David Bressler with the Stroud Water Research Center. Uh, I'm gonna do this in three parts today. I'm going to introduce this citizen science project, uh, then talk about data usage at the local level uh, involving watershed characterizations that we've been doing. And then I'm gonna, in part three, talk about um, directions for the project in terms of uh, trying to standardize this watershed characterization process. So uh, project overview, I'm going to talk about intentions and goals, equipment, the data portal to which data are being sent, and the people supporting the effort. So our main goal here is to support Enviro DIY continuous, continuous monitoring station users to better understand and manage their local watersheds. Um, basically, this is to support data-driven action at the, wa at the local watershed level. So the Enviro DIY monitoring stations are um, primarily equipped with conductivity, uh, temperature and depth sensors, and sometimes turbidity sensors. These stations are designed by uh, the Stroud Center. Uh, the data are collected in five minute intervals and transmitted via cell signal to the Monitor My Watershed data portal where the data can be graphed and summarized. There are over 100 stations now deployed across the Delaware River Basin. Um, the stations are not owned by the Stroud Center, they're owned by over 40 watershed groups, schools, uh, and universities. Um, the median watershed size of these stations uh, is about 10 kilometers. This is a much smaller kind of pool of sites than what are, for instance, in the USGS, among the USGS stations. So this provides us kind of a unique data set to work with. Um, so automated stations, you know, some people think it's easy to put these out and just start collecting data. Um, they are, they are um, automated, but sensors do foul easily and regularly. Um, water and weather are destructive and we have people and creatures that can vandalize and do damage to the stations. So what does this take? It takes a lot of motivated people to monitor the stations on a regular basis and keep up with station function. Um, to go out and clean sensors and uh, maintain the stations overall, as well as do quality control to make sure the data are accurate. So the Stroud Center supports all of these groups in using these stations via technical troubleshooting assistance. We do monthly meetings, online monthly meetings. We do workshops. There are a number of different guidance materials, a manual, quick guides, video tutorials, et cetera. We do one-on-one -on -one assistance and consultation, and we are doing data analysis and interpretation in the context of um, these uh, watershed characterizations that I'm gonna talk about today uh, to support local watershed management. Um, so part two, bulk of the presentation here, data usage at the local level, doing these watershed characterizations and using the basin-wide network of stations, so over, the, over those over 100 stations for context and reference in developing these characterizations. Um, so we polled users to see really what type of support they needed. And we got to this point of these watershed characterizations because the number one response was we need help with understanding and applying the data. They can do the day-to-day -day checking of data, do the maintenance and do the quality control, keep everything situated with the stations. But there's a, there was a need for uh, understanding the data and applying the data um, in, in the local watershed context. So this test case I'm gonna describe here was with the Wallkill Watershed Management Group with support from the Lapat Concrete Initiative. These two ladies here, Christine Rogers and Juniper Liefer, um, did a really nice job with providing detailed feedback on what they needed to be able to, to use the data in their uh, situation in, in terms of management and communication with local stakeholders. So the site uh, for this watershed characterization was on the Pollens Kill, a river in northern New Jersey, at the very headwaters uh, of this river at the Sussex County Community College. So here's the watershed. Um, 
Sea of Very Headwaters, located in northern New Jersey. You can see here it's on this campus of Sussex County Community College right there at the top of the watershed. Um, so this watershed characterization that we wrote up, we kind of framed it according to uh, these five questions here. How do conductivity and temperature data from the station relate to New Jersey DEP criteria? So relating data to the regulatory environment. How do conductivity and temperature data from the station compare to similar data from nearby reference quality streams? So comparing to forested watersheds in that region. Um, what technical and quality control issues need to be addressed to ensure data are usable and reliable? So making sure uh, to follow up with um, making sure the data are accurate and usable. Based on current data, what preliminary recommendations can be made regarding additional data collection? So based on what we know from the station data, what additional information could help fill out that uh, story of the, of the watershed? And then based on current data, what preliminary recommendations can be made regarding management of the watershed to improve health? So this watershed characterization finished up with uh, providing recommendations that could be used to um, improve management in the watershed, guide management in the watershed. Again, this, this sort of uh, data-driven action uh, approach. So um, some of the details of this watershed characterization, I mentioned regulatory environment. So here for water temperature, uh, relating the summertime water temperatures to New Jersey uh, trout production water temperature criteria, you can see exceedances here throughout the summertime period. Um, also compared water temperature to local reference sites. So we have the Pollens Kill water temperature here riding higher throughout the summer than local forested uh, reference sites in the area. And then conductivity, same type of approach with comparing to New Jersey DEP chronic chloride levels. We extrapolated this to conductivity levels. And we can see here for multiple months, uh, exceedances of this, this criterion here. And then same approach compared the conductivity to local uh, reference quality watersheds, so heavily forested watersheds. And again, you can see that the conductivity at this upper Pollens Kill site was significantly higher than the conductivity in these primarily forested watersheds. So once we did that watershed characterization, the uh, Wall Kill group, along with Wapatcon group, um, put together this executive summary where they synthesized the information, boiled it down in a way that they felt was gonna be, they were gonna be able to communicate it to local stakeholders. They also followed up with some of the recommendations. So they put in here some reference to um, uh, trout stock, uh, stock trout um, water temperature thresholds. They also did some follow-up longitudinal sampling to identify and further, uh, further drill down on um, the, the, and develop a picture of this, of what's happening in this upper watershed. You can see a, a increasing trend to, to, down to the sensor station. And then they also compared to uh, locations further down in the Pollens Kill watershed. And you can see here that, that the, the monitoring station site had the highest water temperature of all the sites in the Pollens Kill watershed, even though it is the farthest upstream site um, pretty uncharacteristic of a headwater stream. So, and then finally, they uh, summarized the recommendations from the characterization and uh, grouped them into these different categories. So this, so you can see here, recommendations for the Sussex County Community College Administration, for upstream landowners, for other local environmental organizations, and for the Newton um, municipal officials. So Newton is the nearest town. So providing all these recommendations that they can share with um, local decision makers. So part three, uh, just briefly directions for the project. Uh, again, really generally here, what we're trying to do is use the broad uh, analysis of the data set to support uh, some way to standardize this type of watershed characterization for other, other sites and other groups. So here's a plot of median conductivity values 
for the sites across the Delaware Basin plotted against developed land, and you can see a nice increasing trend. Um, and you, what, what we're doing is, is uh, comparing some of these sites to one another uh, in, in such a way that we can start to sleuth out reasons for um, these elevated levels and reason, reasons why these sites sit where they do in relation to other sites. So you can see here um, sites in heavily impervious pervious areas uh, and, and they're piped. There's a lot of salt gone in there and, and seems to be heavy salt contamination of groundwater. Some natural uh, influences like limestone in some of these sites and then some of these sites sitting downstream of multiple wastewater treatment plants presumably causing elevated conductivity. And then down here below, uh, some sites that are better than expected. Um, the, this block of sites here, they're high, high urban, high developed. However, it's mostly low density, meaning fewer roads, fewer parking lots, more vegetation. Um, water temperature here, we have uh, water temperature during the uh, summer months. It's a slight downward trend, not as much as what you might expect. It, we, the color scheme here is um, according to stream order. It does seem like we have bigger streams um, up here than down below. So trying to we'll, we'll try to tease that out, but also sort of looking here again at some of these outlier sites and identifying, well, why are they sitting, why are certain sites sitting below this uh, general this basic trout threshold of about 70 degrees. And we see a lot of these, there's pretty clear explanations. So we've got limestone influence, we've got a tailwater here with cold water from, a, from the bottom of a dam, pipe streams without sunlight in an urban environment, all remaining cooler than expected. So this type of information hopefully can be used to um, get, develop watershed char characterizations for other sites and um, hopefully be able to standardize this in some way at least. And then one additional thing just to point out, uh, the idea of hydrologic flashiness as represented by conductivity dilution. So you can see here that as development increases, the conductivity rise or it really is a decline during storms uh, caused by dilution of stormwater. So big pulses of water during storms in heavily developed areas uh, causing high dilution and seemingly indicating hydrologic flashiness. So hopefully going uh, into a little bit of uh, direction there with uh, the watershed characterizations as well. Um, so just in conclusion, again, we're trying to, to um, move towards a way to make use of the network of users and the over 100 sites across the Delaware Basin. Um, the benefit we have here is that these are part these these streams are all in the Delaware Basin, a part of a larger group, and it offers us the op opportunity to compare sites. So, you know, is my stream one of the worst? Is it one of the better ones? How does it compare to the median? How does it compare to natural forested reference sites? And then how does it compare potentially to heavily degraded sites, the worst of the worst sites? So putting streams in context to other streams and other um, types of reference conditions. And then also making use of this high population of small streams within the network. Um, I didn't talk about this much here today, but, but one thing in the small network that we're seeing is very high conductivity levels during winter, during and after winter storms when we get flushes of salt, upwards of 50,000 microsiemens per centimeter nearing seawater. Um, so, so looking towards uh, making use of this uh, small stream network and placing streams in, uh, in context that way. So uh, feedback is welcomed and Thank you very much to uh, everyone who's attending, all the volunteers and watershed groups involved with this, key technicians, Shannon Hicks, Rachel Johnson, and Krista Reeves, and then key master watershed stewards involved, Carol Armstrong and George Seeds. This is a William Penn Foundation funded project, Delaware River Watershed Initiative, and also some funding via the PADP Growing Greener Grant Seesaw. So, Thank you and I'll await questions. Thanks.